this first chapter, we're going to look at the safety implications of the equipment we use on the river. We'll take a look at the rescue kit we carry for getting us out of a tight spot. We'll also look at our boats and the outfitting we use to help us make them perform exactly as we want on the river. But before we even get into a boat, we need to think a wee bit about what we want to wear when we go paddling. When we go onto white water, it's a good idea to dress appropriately, both for the conditions and for our abilities. Shorty here, my model number one, is wearing wetsuit boots to protect his feet from the cold and give him something to walk in the bank with, shorts, which have a thin neoprene liner, and a shorty cag. This is good if you know you're not going to be in the water very much and you're paddling in a warm climate. Okay, Shorty? Model number two here is Stuart. Stuart's dressed a bit more for immersion. He's wearing a cag deck top all in one. He's got long waterproof trousers on and he's also wearing wetsuit boots. If he fell in, he probably would get a bit of water in, but Stuart's quite confident that he should stay in his boat, he hopes. Ailey here is dressed for full immersion. She's wearing a shorty cag, but over a wetsuit, which is good because it will keep her warm in cold water and it'll also offer protection in the event of a swim. Doogie here loves swimming. He's wearing a full dry suit. It's important to point out if you're wearing a dry suit that you layer appropriately underneath because you don't want to get too hot as well. Also, with Doogie's shoes, we want to pay attention to the fact that they've got laces on them. This gives a good snug fit, which means you can wear a sole, which is good for scrambling about on uneven surfaces. However, he has to be careful to make sure the laces are tight and that the ends are tucked away to minimise a snag hazard. Thanks, Doogie. Years ago, when I learned to ride a motorcycle, the instructor gave me a really good piece of advice, which was that you only get one head. So this being a safety video, it's probably good we spend a moment talking about helmets. There's a lot of choices in helmets in the market. I've come to the conclusion there's only two things that really matter with a helmet. The first one is that that helmet fits your head. And the second one is, does it protect it well? Most will have some sort of hard plastic or carbon fibre, some foam liner, inserts to pad it out with to make sure you get a really snug fit and a cradle system to hold on to the back of your head and straps to adjust for around your chin. To make sure we're fully dressed for going in the river, next we need to think about what we want from a white water buoyancy aid. The primary function is fairly obvious, it's there to help you float if you find yourself swimming in the water. In order to do that, they're fitted with closed cell foam and the amount of foam that's in them is dependent on the weight of the paddler. Once you've got the buoyancy aid on, use all the adjustment straps to make sure that it fits you snugly and tightly. I would recommend that any white water buoyancy aid that you use has a chest harness fitted to it. The purpose of the chest harness is to tether you either so that you can enter the water safely or so that you can be secured on the bank whilst carrying out rescues. Ensure you understand your particular chest harness and the manufacturer's recommended method of threading the buckle. The chest harness should be releasable under load by the wearer through the use of this buckle at the front. To attach to the rear of the chest harness, always use a locking gate carabiner. While in the subject of carabiners, there are a few other items worth carrying in your person as a basic rescue kit. What we recommend is a 5 metre length of unstitched webbing, three large locking gate carabiners, two prussic loops, two pulleys, a whistle, a throw bag and of course a river knife. The various uses of the items on this list will be covered in more detail throughout the video. Now that we're dressed for action, we need to find out a bit more about the different craft we can use on the river. There's never been such a variety in the range of choices of boats we can paddle on white waters we have today. We've got creek boats, river runners, 
play boats, crossover kayaks, and whitewater open canoes. You'll see all these craft being paddled on most easy to mid-range whitewater. What we need to know are the different safety features that are common to them all. We'll use a creek boat as an example for the common features across most larger kayaks. This is a creek boat. Inside we have the same general outfitting that we'll have in other kayaks. We'll have the ratchets to adjust the back band. We'll have hip pads and a padded seat, thigh braces, all to give us a comfortable fit in the boat. Other features we have in creek boats are these plastic step out pillars inside, which allow a paddler who's in a vertical pin to put their feet on the pillar and step out the boat. As well as the step out pillar inside the boat, the creek boat has a full plate footrest, which covers the full distance of the gap inside the boat. The full plate footrest is attached with metal bars that are locked in place on these little tri screws. Other features with creek boats, and most kayaks in general, is they'll have rescue bars. These are used for attaching haul lines to. This can be for getting a boat up a river bank, or in the case of a more involved extraction, out of the river itself. Some smaller boats will have foam for a centre pillar and foam for the footrest at the front. To get a good fit in these boats, you need to customise the foam outfitting for you. This is an important safety feature. After all, if you're wobbling about inside the boat, you'll probably be wobbling about all over the river. One feature that doesn't come factory fitted with most boats, but that you or someone else in your group might find beneficial is a swim tail. These are just clean lengths of rope or webbing tied to the broach loops at the end of the boat for swimmers to hold when they need help to the bank. The important thing here is to make sure there is enough of the rope left dangling that it can hang off the end of the boat for any swimmers in need. So now let's have a look at outfitting a canoe. For that we'd like to introduce our friend Steve. Uh, so we want to have a wee look at how to set up our open canoe so that it's ready for us um, in the, the white water situation. Starting um, from the end of the boat, I have a painter, which as you can see is drilled straight through onto the, the structure of the boat rather than being attached to any of the fittings um, on the boat. And the painter is long enough to allow me to be standing, say on a rock, this boat is set up for solo paddling, which gives us the opportunity to have much bigger airbags um, in the space, which then helps the, the buoyancy of the boat in the, the rescue scenario. Now, thinking about the self-rescue scenario, there are a number of different options that we can consider, but the simple option is to have a nice long throw line or a rescue line to be more accurate because it's going to be quite a, a heavy bundle of, of rope to actually throw anywhere and then tied on again with a, a quick release hitch and the bag is there and then in the event of me being in the water and if I'm unable to swim my boat into shore I've then got a backup plan that I could actually swim a line into shore and then recover the boat in behind me. Then as I move into paddling position, you'll also see that we've got just some pieces of foam uh, tied in with tape. And that gives me the opportunity to have my center of balance central um, within the boat. Before we wind up this chapter, we need to introduce the clean principle. When we refer to clean lines and clean profiles, we mean free of snag hazards, like this line being removed from a messy twig-filled pool. For a throw line to be a clean line, it must be free of knots, hence why it will have a clean end and a bag end. For our clothing, we will refer to a clean profile. To use buoyancy aids as an example, there is a trade-off as they require straps to ensure a good fit. So the clean profile 
is an ideal we want to strive towards. A kayaker spray deck represents a potential snag hazard, so our general advice on whitewater safety and rescue courses is that you should remove your spray deck when you're practicing swimming. It's one less risk to think about. Kit costs money, so knowing how your equipment functions before you use it will allow you to get the best possible return from your investment. Likewise, knowing the limitations of the kit you carry will help you make the correct judgments on when to use what you have available. Either way, investing in and learning about your kit is only going to improve your paddling experiences.